Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Yeah, folks, that's right. It is time for another episode of Grim Leftovers. We are live right now here on Monday, April 22nd, 2019. This is episode 19 of the Grim Leftovers program. So welcome everybody out there in all the various places you may be tuned in from, wherever that may be, whether it's on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, freedomsnetwork.com, reallliberty.org, or tuned in at one of the many places. Also, we're live on Spreaker as well. So you may want to check out our Spreaker channel sometime and see what the heck's going on over there. Uh, it's been an interesting uh, week, weekend, I guess, uh, whatever. We had uh, Friday, the, the uh, Balls to the Wall program. Grim Moose Girl was out all in the town having a good time. And then on Saturday, you had uh, whatever RLM radio stuff, good stuff. You had the Dark Table and other things like that. And Saturday was... April 20th, or better known as 420, for all of you out there that enjoy the 420 style stuff. Yesterday, Sunday, was Easter Sunday, or as many people call it, uh, Zombie Jesus Day. So that's cool, right? And uh, so today, Monday, the 22nd of April, uh, the uh, solar storms are beginning to hit us. I'm feeling them a little bit, but they'll really be here tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye, keep an eye out. No, keep a, a feel out for those because they will be here. They will come tomorrow uh, in full force. Today we're just getting the, the, the trailing front edge, the trailing front edge, the leading front edge of those solar storms, but they are coming. And uh, so if you're up in the northern climes, like uh, some of our Canadian friends, you may want to check out some of some of the promised Aurora Borealis shows that are supposed to be there. So uh, yeah, check those out. Uh, anyway, um, I think I think that's all good. I think we're ready to start getting on with the stories. Oh, let me say hi to all the folks over here in the chat. We have, we have a great chat room over here on Real Liberty Media. If you're unaware, uh, you can also find it on irc.freenode.net under pound pound. Real Liberty Media, or just on the on the our reallibertymedia.com page there, there's a chat applet uh, on there. You can click the pop-up chat thing, and it'll bring up a window there and allow, allow you to join on into the chat here. And you can talk to all the great folks that are here today. Or the bots and bodies, as Flash Somebody likes to say, because we do have a fair share of bots here as well to help us out with various things, passing along information, the bots like Mr. Barman. And you got myself and Miss Kate. Uh, you got DC and Asmo, Miss Beth Z, Charles Sedoni and Echelon, and Miss Graham Z. Hey, grab it. Uh, we got uh, Don Z. I be Don Z. Mr. Meister Brow, uh, Ponder Gander, uh, Rain and Rob Works and Roams, and uh, a couple more bots, Vanna White and the Weather Dork. They do different things for you here. We got Phantom and Beetle and Colfax and Cyborg Noodle, which is a hybrid bot, half human, half bot. <laughs> He's a cyborg. All right, we got Frumpy and Gromit and Java Doctor and JJ's and Kozu. Uh, we have this Karl Marx bot in here now, and he's a, uh, he's a learning AI bot. Uh, he's supposed to, I guess, be learning from our the way we talk on how to respond to people. And I'm not all that well so far. We got Moose Girl hanging out down here closer to the bottom and Pone Sauce Sock Puppet, Mr. Sock Puppet, Salamo, uh, Vanna White. Uh, wait, this is not Vanna White down here. This is Vanna VV White. That's a, you gotta, you gotta watch out for that one. That's a tricky one. And Mr. Vinny Cass as well. Uh, and there's other people listening in that aren't here in the chat. So howdy to y'all out there that are not here that are listening in. Come on over to the chat if you want to. It's kind of fun. It, it's it's a good time over here. I guarantee it. <laughs> All right. 
Let's get going with the stories. I got a bunch of stories lined up, as I always do. These are stories that uh, were originally lined up for Freakers Ball. Didn't have time for on that show. And so I do this show now on Mondays to kind of get take care of some of those that, that I, I still wanted to talk about. All right. We're going to start with Bitcoin. For any of you crypto traders out there, you may be interested in this information from SputnikNews.com. This was posted on March 24th. Manipulated data. Huh. How familiar. 95% of Bitcoin trading is fake. 95% fake. Hmm. A new, re- a new report published by cryptocurrency research firm Bitwise Asset Management reveals that 95% of Bitcoin spot trading has been inaccurately reported by the majority of cryptocurrency exchanges. In an extensive report submitted to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission last week from then anyway, uh, the company analyzed the, the world's top 81 cryptocurrency exchanges by evaluating trading volumes. Bitwise submitted the information to the SEC as part of the application process to create a new Bitcoin exchange traded fund, ETF. Using financial data reported by leading crypto data provider CoinMarketCap, researchers found that a whopping 95% of the reported trading volume is fake. As a result, only $273 million of the average daily Bitcoin volume instead of the quoted $6 billion is actually legitimate. In other words, there is a fundamentally mistaken impression of the genuine size of the Bitcoin market. People look at the cryptocurrency and, and said, this market is a mess. That's because they were looking at data that was faked, manipulated. Uh, global warming hoaxed. <laughs> uh, that's according to Matthew Hogan, uh, global head of research at Bitwise. Um, when you cut away the echo chamber of nonsense numbers, it should be an efficient, well arbitraged market. The idea is that there's the, the fake volume has been rumored for a long time. We were just the first people to systematically look at which exchanges were delivering real volume. According to the report, only 10 exchanges re- reporting over $1 million average daily volume on CoinMarketCap are actually legitimate, including Binance, Bitfinex, Kraken, Bitstamp, Coinbase, Bitflyer, Gemini, ITBit, Bittrex, and Polonex. I, 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 I use several of those exchanges. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Not all of them. I use Kraken and I have used Coinbase before. Gemini I use and Bittrex and Polonex. Yeah, I use all of those. So uh, anyway, anyway, uh, there is a short list of exchanges with a good reputation. John Har- Hargrave, publisher of Bitcoin Market Journal, recently told Forbes. In December 2018, the Block Cho- Blockchain Transparency Institute, BTI, released an exchange volumes report revealing that only three out of the uh, cryptocurrency's top 25 Bitcoin trading pairs, uh, Binance, Bitfinex, and Liquid, are reporting accurate volumes. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, just be careful, I guess, in what you're doing. But as long as you're a lot, you can go ahead and make your uh, exchanges as needed, then I don't see the big deal about it. Um, so... Uh, there's that. And Rob works in the chat. Just fired up the bubbler. And Salamo got another bubbler from Karl Marx. <laughs> All right. Okay, this next story. I, not an important story. Doesn't really affect anybody's lives outside of those that were here in the story. Unless... You may find yourself in a similar situation at some point in the future and you happen to have some condiments in your vehicle or wherever you happen to be stuck at in the little packages that you get from various 
uh, fast food joints, <laughs> it may be of help to you. From The Guardian. Uh, let's see, when was this posted? March 25th. Okay. Packets of hot sauce save two people's lives in one month. A man in Oregon trapped in his car for five days ate hot sauce and moments after a Taco Bell customer got up from his seat to retrieve some hot sauce, a car burst through the restaurant's wall. Oh, do not throw out those sauce packets collecting in your fridge. Maybe you want to move them to your car. I, I don't know. Um, uh, they just might save your life. At least two people owe their lives to Taco Bell hot sauce after near-death experiences in recent weeks. In Oregon late last month, a man and his dog were trapped in his car for five days and snow piled up. When a snowmobiler rescued Jeremy Taylor and his dog, Allie, both were in decent health, said sheriff's deputies. The two had kept warm by snuggling together in a sleeping bag, and Taylor had nourished himself on hot sauce packets. Allie, who drank melted ice, uh, does not seem to have partaken in the hot sauce. Uh, this is perhaps due to the notoriously notorious difficulty of getting one snout inside the packages. Oh, come on now. He could have easily squeezed that stuff out for uh, Anyway, following the rescue, Taco Bell selflessly weighed in. We know our hot sauce packets are amazing, but this takes it to a whole nother level. <laughs> We're in touch with Jeremy and getting him some well-deserved tacos and a care package. You know, probably after sitting there and eating that stuff for all that well, five days uh, or however long it was exactly, um, he probably does not want to see any more Taco Bell stuff. Maybe he'll keep some in his car. You never know. Um, <laughs> then, uh, last weekend in Florida, hot sauce worked its life-saving magic again in an entirely different way. Moments after a Taco Bell customer got up from his seat to get some more hot sauce, a car burst through the restaurant's wall, right where the customer had been sitting, according to the Miami Herald. Had the customer not sought a fuller flavor for his meal, he could have sustained a devastating injury or even death, a police spokesman, a woman, Jamie Brown, told the Herald. The car had been parked outside the building, and its driver had apparently meant to put it in reverse. Instead, he went forward, and the car plowed uh, 10 feet into the building, police said. Fortunately, no one in the car or restaurant was hurt. The customer should play the lottery, Brown said. <laughs> oh, and these were just the latest hot sauce-linked miracles. A few years ago, what was almost a hot sauce tragedy became quite the opposite. A visitor in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, took on a local store's challenge to try some of its spiciest sauce, an endeavor so risky that it requires signing a waiver. Uh, the Pepper Place's Flash Bang sauce is said to contain a brutal combination of Carolina Reaper, Scorpion, and Habanero peppers. When Randy Schmitz, 30, tasted some on a toothpick, he fell to the ground and began convulsing. The seizure led to an MRI that revealed a malignant tumor in his brain, which was removed days later. If I didn't try that hot sauce, I think something eventually would have triggered a seizure and I would have uh, found out, but the, that cancer tumor would have grown inside my head. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, hot sauce is just amazing stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vinny is posting here in a chat a link uh, to, to another story about how cayenne pepper stops a heart attack in 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that, Vinny. Um, <laughs> yeah, man, that, that hot stuff will do something to you. It will cause an effect, generally a good effect. It may just make you sweat a lot and... Uh, make your mouth burn and do other various things, but mostly it just tastes good. I, I, I use various forms of uh, fairly hot hot sauce on various foods that I make. I, I love the stuff. Uh, I don't think it's ever saved my life yet, but you never know. 
<laughs> that day may come. All right, here's one a little uh, not not quite so lighthearted, but informational. Eight historic cases that show the FBI and CIA were out of control long before Russia Gate. The survival of liberty depends on skepticism of government power. And make no mistake, that includes the Trumpster, Trumpy, Trumpzilla. <laughs> this is, oh, by the way, it's on, posted on fee.org, the Foundation for an econo Economic Education. And this was posted up on March 25th. Conservatives, or those that call themselves conservatives, I don't consider them conservatives, uh, just by many of the policies that they like to follow, but they're being called conservatives here, so we'll go with that. Uh, conserv statists, yeah, conservatives, yeah, socialists, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the conservatives don't want to be called socialists, but they are. So uh, that's that's a whole other story that we don't need to get into right now. Um, <laughs> conservatives tend to have two bad habits. First, they're prone to viewing the past through a nostalgic lens. Second, they tend to instinctively give law enforcement the militaristic jackboots that call themselves law enforcement the benefit of the doubt. Yes, it's played as hero worship. Wor worship anybody wearing a, a state-issued costume. These tendencies help explain why conservatives for decades have been able to overlook the many abuses, constitutional, legal, and moral, of the United States intelligence agencies. Unlike some more seasoned media, conservatives have apparently genuinely uh, shock, been shocked by the revelations of the Trump-Russia saga. Abuse of FISA warrants, classified leaks from top FBI brass, corruption, campaign moles, and an apparent plot to remove an elected president through an undemocratic and likely extra-constitutional means. These revelations are unique in that they have become highly public, involving a sitting president. However, the examination of history of the United States intelligence agencies reveals government bureaucracies have been out of control for a long, long time, well before the 2016 presidential election. Number one, that time that the CIA... Uh, wait, wait, let me do this. Hey, hey, you remember that time when the, when the CIA considered bombing Miami and blaming it on Castro? Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Uh, anyway, no, that's not exactly what it, but it, but that is what it says. It's no secret that the United States government sought to assassinate Fidel Cadet Castro for years. Less well known, however, was the part of their regime change plot uh, included a plan to blow up Miami and a sink and sinking a full boat of innocent Cubans. The plan was revealed in 2017 when the National Archives declassified 2,800 documents from the JFK era, was a collaborative effort that included the CIA, the State Department, the Department of Defense, and other federal agencies that sought to brainstorm strategies to topple Castro and so unrest within Cuba, while looking all hands clean and innocent. One of those plans included Operation Northwood, submitted to the CIA by General Lyman Lemons, Lemon, Lem, Lemnitzer <laughs> okay. on behalf of the Joint Chief of Staff. Uh, it summarized nine pretexts the CIA and the, USA, and the U.S. government could employ to justify military intervention in Cuba. One of the official CIA documents shows uh, officials musing about a st staging a terror campaign, real or simulated, blaming it on Cuban refugees. We could develop a Cuban communist terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. Uh, the Operation Mongoose document says, the terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees 
seeking haven in the U.S. We could sink a boatload of Cubans and route to Florida, real or simulated, uh, which would be whether it's just a plain old hoax or a false flag. Uh, the false flag would be real, simulated would be hoax. Uh, we, we could foster attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the U.S., exploding a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots. Ultimately, the broader mongoose effort failed to remove Castro from power or effectively establish an infiltration within Cuba, though the CIA did engage in several sabotage missions, uh, operations, Mongoose was suspended and ultimately discontinued amid the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is another big fake thing. <laughs> anyway. In 2014, the CIA was caught red-handed spying on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Yep, in the summer of 2014, the CIA's Inspector General concluded that the CIA had improperly spied on the U.S. Senate staffers who were researching the agency's black history of torture. An internal investigation by the CIA found that its officers penetrated a computer network using the Senate Intelligence Committee in preparing for its damning report on the CIA's detention and interrogation program. And that is not the worst part. The Times goes on to note the CIA officers didn't just read the emails of Senate investigators, they also sent a criminal referral to the Justice Department based on phony, false, faked information. John Brennan, CIA director from 2013 to 2017, insisted during Senate hearings that these were very limited, inappropriate actions and that the actions of the CIA were reasonable. Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon disagreed. Yep, that's not what the Inspector General concluded, Wyden said. When you're talking about the spying on a committee responsible for overseeing your agency, in my view, that undermines the very checks and balances that protect our democracy, and it's unacceptable uh, in a free society. And your compatriots in all your sister agencies agree with that. Brennan, who publicly lied about the episode, was not punished and even retained his security clearance until August of this year, or last year. Um. <laughs> oh, we got a sip of water here. <laughs> all right. Number three. The FBI's suicide letter to Martin Luther King and his wife. Before he had a day named in his honor and a monument on the National Mall, the government viewed Martin Luther King Jr. very much as a threat. In fact, his message of peace, love, equality, and civil disobedience had the FBI so scared that agents actually sent King uh, and his wife a package containing a strange letter and a tape recording. It contained details of the civil rights activist's sexual indiscretions and encouraged him to kill himself. In 1961, the FBI learned that Stanley Levinson, a known red commie bastard, had become close to a close advisor to King. Uh, the following year, Bobby Kennedy approved wiretaps on Levinson's home and the office uh, home and office surveillance that would eventually expand. It turns out J. Edgar Hoover, Mr. Mr. Dresswear, stumbled onto MLK's busy sex life while investigating King. Uh, Hoover found out very little about any communist subterfuge, but he did uh, begin to learn about King's extramarital sex life. The FBI apparently had no scruples about using the information to try to bring King down. James Comey, Gage writes, used a copy of the King wiretap request on his desk, uh, or used to keep a copy of the King wiretap on his desk, as a reminder of the Bureau's capacity to do wrong. Number four. The CIA forced prisoners to participate 
in mind control experiments. It says here in the 50s, but I guarantee you this is still going on. And it's been going on the whole time. If you've never heard of Project MKUltra, <laughs> it's likely you've never been to the RLM chat here. <laughs> but if you've never heard of MKUltra, you might find it hard to believe. Also known as the CIA Mind Control Program, the effort was launched by the agency in 1953. The program used drug experiments on humans, oftentimes on prisoners who were tested against their will or possibly maybe in exchange for an early release or death, because that was often the case too. Uh, the experiments were undertaken so CIA, CIA agents could better understand how to extract information from enemies, which pretty much to the CIA, everybody's an enemy, uh, during interrogations. Here's a description from the History Channel, but we also know, all know the, the History Channel uh, is a big statist organization as well. Anyway, MKUltra's mind control experiments generally centered around behavior modification via electroshock therapy, hypnosis, polygraphs, radiation, and a variety of drugs, toxins, and chemicals. These experiments relied on a range of test subjects some who freely volunteered, and some who volunteered under coercion, and some who had absolutely no idea they were involved in a sweeping defense research program. From mentally impaired boys at a state school, to American soldiers, to sexual psychopaths at a state hospital, MKUltra's program often preyed on the most vulnerable, mem vulnerable members of society. The CIA considered prisoners especially good subjects as they were willing to give consent in exchange for extra recreation time or commuted sentences. Whitey Bulger, remember Whitey? <laughs> A former organized crime boss wrote of his experience as an inmate test subject in the MKUltra program. Eight convicts in, in a panic and paranoid state uh, Bulger said of the 1957 test at the Atlanta, Atlanta Penitentiary, where he was serving time, total loss of appetite, hallucinating, the room would change shape. Uh, this sounds fun to me. Um, hours of paranoia and feeling violent. I could do without those two. Uh, we experienced horrible periods of living nightmares and even blood coming out of the walls. Guys turning into skeletons in front of me. See, I, I would have no problem with that. Guys turning into skeletons in front of you, blood coming out of the walls. I don't, I don't mind that. Um, I, I saw a camera change into the head of a dog. I, it felt like I was going insane. <laughs> How was any of this legal? Well, it wasn't, which is why the CIA understood it had to be concealed from the American public at all costs. Precautions must be taken not only to protect operations from exposure to enemy forces, but also to conceal these activities from the American public in general, wrote a CIA auditor. The knowledge that the agency is engaging in unethical and illicit activities would have serious repercussions in political and diplomatic circles. <laughs> If any of you are surprised by any of that, <laughs> let me do one more. Uh, then you can look through the, the, the list. Well, let me just give you the headlines of the rest. How about that? The FBI's systemic forensic fraud in crime labs. Yes, they fake information in order to nail people uh, all the time. Yes. Uh, number six, Operation Midnight Climax drugging unsuspecting Johns and filming their interaction with prostitutes. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number seven. And this one is maybe probably the most important of any of them and still ongoing. Today, yesterday, the day before, every day, all the time, they're doing this. Number seven. The FBI has routinely staged acts of terrorism. It says here, in the wake of 
but uh, you might want to include 9-11 as part of that. The FBI has, on numerous occasions, targeted unstable and mentally mentally ill individuals, sending informants to uh, bait them into committing terror attacks, which, of course, it's all planned and they know exactly what's going to happen ahead of time. Uh, Giving a little bit of... Well, they don't always do what you think they're going to do. Uh, Before these individuals can actually carry out an attack, however, the Bureau intervenes, presenting the foiled plot to the public as a successfully thwarted attack. In 2011, journalist Glenn Greenwald summarized several examples of this deceitful tactic. The FBI subjected 19-year-old Somali-American Mohammed Osman Muhammad to months of encouragement support and money and convinced him to detonate a bomb at a crowded Christmas event in Portland, Oregon, only to arrest him at the last moment and then issue a press release boasting of the FBI's wonderful success. They're genius. In late 2009, the FBI persuaded and enabled Hassan Mahar Hussein Smadi, a 19-year-old Jordanian citizen, to place a fake bomb at the Dallas skyscraper and separately convinced Farouk Ahmed, a 34-year-old naturalized American citizen in ba- in Pakistan, from Pakistan, uh, to bomb the Washington Metro. There are so many examples to uh, show what the FBI has done, how they've set up patsies and brainwashed them and convinced them to do certain things where they were going to go ahead and intervene at the last moment to prevent any real damage, uh, but to pat themselves on the back hugely, um, that it would take several hours to go through the ones just since 2000. Number eight, the CIA's media manipulation campaigns. So you're sitting there watching the news thinking you're hearing a good, honest story, and lo and behold, it's a CIA made up piece of crap Uh, from the agency's earliest days it has attempted to control the flow of information to the public in his book legacy of ashes a history of the cia former new york times journalist tim weiner no relation to anthony that i know of uh, documented how much influence uh, the agency's first civilian director alan dulles who's got that big airport named after him Uh, had among major media companies. Dulles kept in close touch with the men who ran the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the nation's leading weekly magazines. He could pick up the phone and edit a breaking story, making sure uh, an irritating foreign correspondent was yanked from the field or hire the services of men such as Times uh, Berlin Bureau Chief and Newsweek man in Tokyo. Uh, In 1977, Carl Bernstein uh, further exposed the CIA's efforts to influence news organizations in an article for the Rolling Stone in which he revealed that more than 400 American journalists in the past 25 years have secretly carried out assignments for the CIA according to documents on file at the CIA headquarters. Anyway, um, the lesson here, if you haven't picked it up yet. Amid the media and political establishments ongoing frenzied coverage of Russiagate, Americans are eager to pin the guilt on the president have shown the willingness to trust the state, the CIA, the FBI, uh, the NSA, the TSA, whatever, whoever, your local police, whoever, without question, despite numerous past and present reasons, to be skeptical, to absolutely know that they are lying about any conclusions or information passed along to you. Considering the CIA's long history of lying and intervening and creating false narratives in in other countries' elections and governments, it's particularly ironic that their claims of Russian meddling in the United States democracy, if you want to call it that, are taken at face of value. (laughs) There's there's more to the story for you to get in there and read at a later time because holy crap, holy. 
They lie. They lie, they lie, they lie, they lie. I'm always so uh, dry mouthed when I do this show. I'm not really sure why, but I am. All right. Asus is a company that I that I actually have enjoyed their products for many, many years. I actually have a very nice Asus laptop sitting right here next to me. That's the one that a couple of bots reside on. It's uh, running Linux Mint 19.1. Um, but it's a beautiful laptop, and, and I've had it for, I don't know how long, many years, seven, eight years. Uh, anyway, I've, and I've got a lot of other Asus products, and, and I've given Asus products as gifts to other folk. So I was a little disturbed by this story off techdirt.com, March 26th. Asus goes mute as hackers covertly install backdoors using company software update. And I should note that I never use the company software updates regardless of, of whether it's an Acer machine that I got here, uh, the Asus machine that I have there, Dells that I've had previously, other brands of computers if I bought a, a built computer before. I, I don't use their company's update. No, 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 no. I'm going to find better ways to update my, my firmware and software. Well, not the firmware, but uh, the software anyway. <laughs> Oh, anyway, according to a new analysis by Kapersky Lab, nearly a million PC and laptop owners may have installed malicious ACES software update that embedded a backdoor into their computers without their knowledge. According to the security form, firm, uh, state-sponsored hackers, uh, it says here presumed to be China, but I'm going to guess the, the U.S. The NSA in on that one. Uh, managed to subvert the company's live update utility, which is pre-installed on most ASUS computers and is used to automatically update system components, such as BIOS, UEFI, uh, drivers, and applications. Now, again, I, I've not used their automated software ever to update my BIOS uh, because I like to handle that manually because I, I don't trust those automated BIOS updates. Uh, I never have, but... Yeah, maybe they're better now. I don't know. Anyway, the malicious file was signed by a legitimate ASUS digital certificate uh, to hide the fact that it was not a legitimate software update from the company with an eye on a very particular target range. Uh, the goal of the attack was to surgically target an unknown pool of users which were identified by their network adapters' MAC addresses. To achieve this, the attackers had to hard code a list of MAC addresses into the Trojanized samples, and this list was used to identify the actual intended targets of the massive operation. We were able to extract more than 600 unique MAC addresses from over 200 samples used in this attack. Of course, there might be other samples out there with different MAC addresses in their list, or you might actually be faking your MAC address, which is something you could do. You may have never looked into that, but it's a handy little thing to do sometimes. Uh, according to Vin E. Fee, the F Foundation for Economic Education, uh, is headed by his friend, Brian Hyde's friend. Well, his friend's friend, I guess. <laughs> All right. A friend of a friend. All right, we, we got you. Anyway, according to Kapersky, over 57,000 Kapersky users have downloaded and installed the backdoored version of Asus Live Update at some point in time. And while Symantec has confirmed the problem, it stated it found 13,000 computers infected with backdoor. Kapersky estimates the total number of PCs uh, impacted the, could be as high as 1 million. For its part, however... Asus is not helping matters by going entirely mute, silent on the subject. Motherboard was the first, uh, the first to report on the hack, in turn prompting Kapersky's acknowledgement. But Asus apparently thought it was better to be silent, silent, um, instead of owning the problem, confirming the data discovered by researchers, or quickly and accurately informing the company's subscribers. 
you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I've, I've always liked the company Asus. They've, they've put out some really nice products over time. And, um, I, I have certainly enjoyed their, their products. So, um, I, what do you say? Uh, you, you can't trust anybody. Trust no one. The truth is out there. All right. Hmm. Does anybody, um, does anybody out there listening? First off, anybody that's got any kind of depression, feeling not quite up to it, I guess. And if you do, do you take magnesium supplements or eat a lot of foods that are high in magnesium? If not, you might want to. If you have a uh, depression type situation going on inside of your brain. Magnesium to make depression drugs obsolete? New science finds magnesium is safer, more affordable, and more effective than serotonin, serot, what? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. I had to remember that because they don't tell you there. Uh, anyway. <laughs> More than 350 million people on our planet suffer from depression. And it also has a profound effect on their loved ones. One of the most popular treatments, SSRI, antidepressants, is risky. Oh, very, very risky. Expensive and not really effective. This has prompted some scientists to look for alternatives. And it appears they might have found a good solution in the form of magnesium. This mineral is vital for many of our body's functions, including your blood pressure, heart rhythm, and bone strength. It also helps fight inflammation in the body. Uh, now scientists from the University of Vermont's Lair, Lair, Lammer, Larner College of Medicine have found promising results after a clinical trial involving the use of over-the-counter magnesium tablets in depressed patients. In the blocked and randomized crossover trial uh, of 126 adults using outpatient primary care clinics, participants with mild to moderate depression were studied over the course of 12 weeks. Some participants were given 248 milligrams of magnesium. Why not just round it to 250, you know, man, what the hell? 248 milligrams of magnesium each day for the course of six weeks, followed by six weeks without it. Whereas those in the control group received no treatment for six weeks, followed by six weeks of magnesium. All participants were given a bi-weekly assessment uh, of their depression symptoms. Those who took the elemental magnesium chloride noted clinical clinically significant improvements in anxiety symptoms and measures of depression on the patient health questionnaire nine uh, which asks the patients nine questions to diagnose and classify depression participants scored six points lower on average during their time taking magnesium that lower average is a good thing by the way in case we're not quite getting that Best of all, uh, they experienced these improvements after just two weeks of taking the magnesium. In addition, patients of all ages and depression types tolerated the supplements well and noted similar levels of effectiveness. So the connection between magnesium and depression has been established. It appears to support another study in a Croatian psychiatric hospital that discovered that many patients who had attempted suicide, somebody's talking at me, I guess, uh, that had attempted suicide suffered from dangerously low levels of magnesium. In fact, depression can be a sign of magnesium deficiency. And as can ring in your ears, which I do get that sometimes, I, I may be low on the magnesium. I don't know. Um... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, anyway, um, if you do have depression, hopefully you're not taking the SSRIs. Those things are extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, but if you are on the SSRIs, you don't just want to stop them cold turkey either. 
uh, that that will cause other severe problems. So start taking the magnesium, back off the SSRIs slowly, and and uh, you should be fixed. You should be good to go. Keep taking the magnesium if if that if that seems to be a deal, because uh, if if you seem to still have depression, or if not, because it like it like the article says, your body needs the magnesium for blood pressure, heart rhythm, bone strength, inflammation in the body. So it, it's all around good stuff. Um, so absolutely check that out in in your uh, supplement regime if you have a supplement regime. So, all right, another sip of water here. Well, well, well. How about this? <laughs> For March 25th, Daily Mail. Yeah, the dailymail.com or co.uk, however you want to look at it. Is this proof of life on Mars? NASA's Curiosity rover snaps photos of Martian mushrooms that prove the red planet is home to organic life forms, scientists claim in a controversial study. Images from the surface of Mars reveal the presence of mushrooms, a group of scientists have claimed in a controversial new study. In states... Uh, some Im in state, oh, it states, not in states, it states some images captured by NASA's curiosity show fungi is growing on the surface of the supposedly barren planet. The claims, uh, well, NASA is never a straight answer, as you know, so uh, they, but NASA has not refuted them or confirmed them. But if you look at the photo here in the article, you'll say, well, they ain't rocks. There's something that looks like they're growing. Huh. Yeah. And they're... Yeah, they look. They certainly look like mushrooms to me. The research lists 15 images as evidence of algae, lichens, or Martian mushrooms. I wonder if these Martian mushrooms have any psychedelic effect capabilities. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm on the Martian shrooms. Uh, anyway, photographic evidence such as uh, flourishing life forms, should the discovery be confirmed, would likely revolutionize the understanding of Mars and life outside of Earth. Dr. Regina Das of the Department of Microbiology at the School of Life Sciences India, the study's co-author said, there are no geological or other abiogenic forces on Earth which can produce sedimentary structures by the hundreds which have mushroom shapes, stems, stalks, and shed what are apparently spores on the surrounding surface. Yeah, rocks don't tend to uh, shed spores. And they don't have stalks. <laughs> uh huh. In fact, 15 specimens were photographed by, NASA's, by NASA growing out of the ground in just three days. It remains unknown why life may have sprouted on Mars, but it's possible uh, conditions are more suitable for cultivating life underground than on the surface. A, a controversial piece of research such as this is subjected to extensive vetting by peers within the scientific community. Yeah, because just your eyes, you know, they, they're no good. Just just viewing what you see there. Yeah. Editors of the journal say six independent scientists and eight senior editors were recruited to scrutinize the study. Eleven recommended publication on the grounds. Uh, uh, on the ground, certain revisions were implemented and three rejected the results. Other academics proposed an alternative explanation and say it's more feasible the specimens are hematite, a form of iron oxide. Yeah, no, hematite also, no spores. As the journal states, evidence is not proof. Huh? And there is no proof of life on Mars. Evidence is not 
proof. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, abiogenic explanations for this evidence cannot be ruled out. Um, uh, yeah, well, I don't, I don't know that there's any uh, jackboots up on Mars yet to enforce um, making these Martian shrooms illegal, but uh, you can be sure that if you are able to get there, they are able to get there, and you know them. You know how they are. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm a little behind here. I'm going to have to speed things up. All right, uh, this one, this article from cyberscoop.com, which I, I used to be on LinkedIn for a little while just because people that I used to work with, after I moved here, uh, which I had no need to be on LinkedIn when, once I was here, but people that I used to work with kept on requesting me to join LinkedIn because they really like LinkedIn. It's for working professional type people. And uh, so anyway, I signed up on there and I found it to be useless and I got rid of it. But here it is, LinkedIn, and, and I should have stayed on maybe just for this. Maybe they would have recruited me. LinkedIn <laughs> is becoming China's go-to platform for recruiting foreign spies. Uh, yeah, Buried in the 41-page felony complaint, Charging a former U.S. intelligence operative of spying for the Chinese, FBI investigators declared that the suspect, Ron Rockwell Hansen, has been printing information for his colleagues' LinkedIn pages. <laughs> Hansen, a former Defense Intelligence Agency case officer who pleaded guilty on March 15th to attempted espionage against the U.S., took information from the professional networking site related to several former and current DIA case officers before a 2015 trip to China. The complaint does not state how the information was used, if at all, but it's enough to raise the notion Hansen may have been passing LinkedIn. Can't the Chinese just go on to LinkedIn and get this information? Uh, most people, if you, you know, ask them to be a friend or a colleague on LinkedIn, are going to go ahead and say okay. And it's not like it's classified stuff. It's up there on freaking LinkedIn. Anyway, apparently China likes the uh, the whole idea of uh, finding professionals of uh, various backgrounds on LinkedIn and getting people to grab their information, at least according to this boogeyman article here. So um, <laughs> it would be of no surprise to me that they could just go ahead and get all the information they want off of that site on their own. All right, uh, this next article from Minds.com, posted March 25th by Paul 8 Ryan, there on Minds, is called Unvaccinated versus Vaccinated. For years, the debate has run rampant. As long as there have been vaccines, there have been vaccine skeptics. Notably, as far back as the 1800s, Leicester, England, had the highest vaccination rates in the country, yet they were seeing more cases of smallpox than ever. So the town agreed to shun the vaccine. Everyone thought the world was going to end and that this town would be ground zero. This, is obvi this obviously, however, was not the case. And things improved for people of Leicester, so there's always been that question mark around vaccines. It didn't just start with Andrew Wakefield in the 90s. See, we only had a couple of vaccines. Smallpox, polio came along. We covered that already. Measles, rubella, mumps. But there were always issues. Issues that got swept under the rug. And it's not just autism. It, it came into the fray later, going into 1 in 10,000 in the 80s, when we got four or five vaccines, vaccines at the age of four to five, and getting about 50 plus from birth, before birth even. It's happened gradually, and today we have autism rates of one in 35 to one in 100, depending on where you are. And if you watched William Walsh's talk on epigenetics, it's easy to understand how it's happened. And vaccines aren't the only culprit. It's our food and agriculture industries, our ignorance towards toxins, toxins we're introducing, injecting. It's ludicrous, really. So people have been screaming 
for a, a large scale study comparing the overall health of the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated for years. But of course, they're not going to do that. They, they, they have no desire to do that. They, they don't want to prove to you any of that. <laughs> there are always ways it could be done, but it never has. Why is that, I wonder? Because it would probably show something like this, but probably worse. The one I look at is autism. The vaccinated have rates of autism 4.2 times that of the unvaccinated. 30 times more likely to suffer from allergies, the immune system attacking itself, and it's confused, and it's not that confusing at all when you understand the nature of a vaccine. Knock that off, Vinny. <laughs> you and your dang fake ducks. <clears throat> all right. What picking up trash in a police state looks like. Man cited by police for improperly cleaning a river. <laughs> Columbus, Georgia. This is, uh, by the way, on uh, the freethoughtproject.com posted uh, July 30th, 2017. I don't know how I got this old article in my list, but here it is. Two college students learned the hard way that life in a police state often includes unnecessary interrogation, false accusations and citations for victimless, quote, crimes, unquote, even when the suspects in question were helping clean up the community. YouTubers Brandon Jordan and Tristan Yaptango, both students at Columbus State University, were interrupted by police while they were filming what they referred to as River Treasure video for Jordan's YouTube channel, Jiggling with Jordan. Uh, this consisted of the pair diving into the local river and recovering objects they found at the bottom, sometimes unique finds and sometimes just trash that they removed from the river. Anyway, I don't have time to go into all of it with you here, but bear in mind that they, they were treated like criminals for performing a public service, a community service. I hate to use the word public, but uh, that's, that's, that's the word many people understand. But a community service. Um, and, and so the jackboots, probably being bored, maybe they were out of donuts for the morning. Who, who knows? Their steroids were kicking into overdrive. And they decided, yeah, we got to go over there and harass these guys that are doing something good because they didn't like them being in the river. Oh, you're swimming in the river. That's not allowed. <laughs> oh, well, how about some little, little, we'll finish it up here with a little bit of uh, future police state. <laughs> yeah. On Forbes.com, March 26th, new cars in Europe will be prevented from speeding. Yep, drivers in Europe will soon have to get uh, used to anti-speeding devices in their cars after EU legislatures, legislators agreed this morning on new legislation requiring them. The agreement came after months of tense negotiations which pitted safety against freedom. There's never a question. If freedom is at, at risk, the, the safety goes out the window. Let me tell you that right now. At least in my mind, in my way of thinking, my anarcho-capitalist mindset. But that's not the state. That's not how the state thinks. Prompted by concerns over Big Brother watching driving behavior, the legislation will require all new vehicles put on the market to be equipped with intelligent speed assistance, ISA technology. The devices can use sign recognition uh, video cameras or GPS linked data to automatically limit the speed of a vehicle. They do so by limiting the engine power to prevent the vehicle from accelerating past the limit. So let's say you're at home and somebody there gets injured and you need to get them to the hospital because they're bleeding out or whatever. Too bad, so sad, your car's not going to let you do that. Just a number of other things. It's none of the government's business how fast you're driving as long as you're not out there running into people. Um, 
But, you know, that's the way those bureaucrats think. So there's that for you. All right. <laughs> I'm a little bit at the end of my, over my time here. But um, I'll tell you, I'll be back next Monday with another edition, another episode. Episode 20 will be next week. Uh, this is episode 19 of the Grim Leftovers program. And uh, I look forward to doing that. Tomorrow, you got Flash Somebody in a Perfect World, probably with Vinny, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Grammy is on at her normal time, Wednesday and Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Grammy's Rocket Chair. Do not miss it. Uh, Thursday is Flash once again with 20% off his solo show. And then uh, Vinny is on his solo show on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Ponder Gander. Um, Myself and the Moose Girl will be on Friday night. Freakers Ball, don't miss that. Awesome stuff. Uh, Dork Table is Saturday at noon Eastern. Blues are at Sunday noon Eastern. Hal is at 3 p.m. West, noon Pacific. Wait, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. (laughs) Get the country flipped around here. With uh, Behind a Woodshed, over name for the whoop-ass. So uh, that's all. Have yourselves a great rest of the uh, Earth Day. It's Earth Day. (laughs) All right, I'll talk to you all later. Peace.